What's up you guys? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Danielle Hallen and I am back with a much anticipated update video. For the past month or so, I feel like we've all been on the edge of our seats waiting to see what was going to happen with the Paul Ferguson sentencing. And now that we have that information, it went exactly as I hoped that it would. But before I can get into all those details, I do wanna let you guys know about something very, very exciting. I will be at CrimeCon Nashville this year from May 31st to June 2nd, and I am so freaking excited, you guys. The first ever CrimeCon that I attended was in Nashville like five or six years ago, and myself and John Lorden were actually the first YouTubers to be invited to the event. It felt like such a monumental moment for us, and so to see everything kind of like circle around and how huge the event's gonna be this year, how many amazing amazing, amazing content creators from YouTube are gonna be there. It's going to be such a good time, you guys. So I hope some of you guys come out there to say hello, meet a bunch of great people, learn a bunch of awesome things. So if you wanna head out to Nashville this year, you can use my code Hallen to get 10% off of a standard badge. I'll have everything that you need linked down below to get yourself a ticket so you can come have an awesome weekend with all of us. Now into the details. As you guys know, 20-year-old Paul Ferguson was facing child abuse charges in regards to the death of his 15-year-old brother, Timothy Ferguson that I made a video on a couple of weeks ago. Obviously that original video is linked down below and I highly suggest if you've not seen it to go watch it because this video is not going to make a lick of sense to you. I will give a very brief refresher real quick. So Timothy was again 15 years old and had spent majority of his life in the care of his father and stepmother but in 2021 it was decided that raising a son with multiple diagnoses like autism and ADHD was apparently too difficult so Timothy's mother Shonda Vander Ark was told that she had to take Timothy in or his dad was going to hand him over to CPS. And ultimately, Shonda moved Timothy to her home in Michigan, despite the fact that she had no legal custody of him. And not just that, she had actually been investigated for abuse in regards to her children years prior, which is the exact reason she lost custody to begin with. So Timothy was living with Shonda, his mom, her husband, their son that they had together, as well as Timothy's older brother, Paul. And within a few months, months of living there, the dynamic, I guess, changed. Shonda's husband ended up moving out, and it was at this point that the torture and abuse began for Timothy. And the judge who handed down the sentencing, you'll see later on, mentioned something about this fact, about this timing, that I've thought this whole entire time, and I'm so happy he finally went ahead and said it. Basically, for the entire time of January 2022 to July 2022, Timothy was horribly abused. He was fed only hot sauce soaked in bread. He was punished severely. He was made to sleep in a closet, forced to take ice baths, amongst dozens of other devastating things. And ultimately, on July 6, 2022, this all led to his death. Fonda and Paul claimed that he had been on a hunger strike and explained away all of the cameras and motion sensors and locks that were all over the home as ways to just manage Timothy, when in reality, they all played a huge part in his abuse. Now, both Shonda and Paul were ultimately arrested, Shonda for murder and child abuse, and Paul for child abuse alone. Alone. And Shonda's trial started this last December, right around the time that I posted my video, and it was intense, you guys. Both Paul and Shonda pointed the finger at each other, and Paul had actually taken a deal in hopes of leniency and testified against his mother. And it was so interesting to watch him testify against his mom in court because you could really tell that he was trying to victimize himself. Um, he was trying to say that he was basically forced into everything that he did. And the narrative from Paul and Shonda seemed to really be that they had no idea somehow that what they were doing to Timothy was harmful, despite thousands of texts showing their careful plotting to harm Timothy as much as they could. Now, obviously, I'm not going all into the details again in this video, so again, refer to the first video if you need to, but the information that came out during this trial is some of the most upsetting that I have ever, ever heard. And thankfully, Shonda ended up being found guilty and she was sentenced to life in prison. And the judge, Judge Castle, was absolutely outstanding. And he made it very clear that she was far too smart to try to play dumb, which seemed to be her game the entire time. She was fully aware of what she was doing to her son and what could happen at the end of the road that she decided to take. But the big mystery factor really in all of this was was what's going to happen to Paul? Despite getting the lesser of the charges because he was only facing child abuse charges, he was never charged with the murder of his brother like his mom. He was described this entire time as being the enforcer. 
Shonda would essentially give him orders and he would act them out. And it seems that he dealt out the majority of the abuse towards Timothy based on the information that has been made public. While he was testifying against his mother in her trial, he really victimized himself and he seemed to downplay what he and his mother had both done, saying that he essentially had to follow his mother's orders and that he had tried to help Timothy a time or two. But a lot of the evidence, including his own words, as well as statements from those that knew Paul, seemed to suggest that that was not at all the case. Paul had been described by siblings as a huge bully and that he had always been that way. And he had also always targeted Timothy, even as a younger child. There were even claims that Paul would have been diagnosed as a psychopath, but they couldn't do it because he was under age, which is a valid thing that happens. So as you probably saw in even my own comment section, there have been a lot of really strong feelings across the board when this case really blew up in the media. There were lots of people that believed that Paul was manipulated to do all of this by his mother. Maybe he was dealing with some sort of psychological issues, or maybe there was some um, underlying diagnosis that played a part in this, and that he should not be held accountable for the part that he played, at least not to some sort of extreme extent. And I think a lot of those opinions stemmed from the way Paul presented himself on stand. While on the flip side, there were a lot of other people that felt that the testimonies from those in his life and kind of like his body language during testifying and his own words really showed that he knew exactly what he was doing and he definitely needed to be held accountable. And that was kind of the line that I was leaning towards in my last video. I've been anxiously waiting for the sentencing to see if any psyche valves were done and ultimately what would end up happening because with the history that he has, there's just this huge fear there that he would absolutely do something like this again. While manipulation is definitely something that can come into play in a situation like this, especially when it's a mother and son dynamic, it just seemed like he was all too eager to participate in what was happening to Timothy. So his sentencing is about an hour long and I really encourage you guys to watch the entire thing. It's pretty easy to get through, but majority of it really revolves around that same thinking. The prosecution was super thankful that Paul testified against his mother because because in all honesty, it was the largest piece that likely helped to put her in prison for life. I have no doubt in my mind that with the evidence they had without his testimony, they would still have successfully convicted her. But I really think that that personal connection to it, him playing a part in it, really ensured that there was no way she was going to get out of what happened. But at the same time, they also acknowledged that he played just as big of a part in the abuse. Paul did end up undergoing several evaluations. I have not seen the extent of any of them. I don't know if any of them were even fully released. So I'm just going off of bits and pieces that were kind of announced during this hearing. And according to those evaluations, his upbringing was filled with abuse, which we already knew. That was something that all of the children seemed to have endured. Um, but they also mentioned something very interesting, that he was raised in a way where they normalized abnormal behavior. And obviously that is a massive factor in how all of this came to be. So there are so many people out there that have very strong feelings on, you know, well, I was raised this way and I still didn't go on to do this X, Y, and Z, but psychologically, it's not always that simple. But on the flip side of that, one of the evaluations suggested that Paul may have antisocial personality disorder. Now, keep in mind, I'm not a doctor. I have to preface this every time because I always get comments saying, you don't know what you're talking about. You're right, I don't. Um, I will never pretend that I absolutely do. So this information I'm about to tell you is pulled from Google, so take it as you will. But typically those with ASPD, quote, tend to lie, break laws, act impulsively, and lack regard for their own safety or others. Manipulation can also be involved. There is a lack of remorse, a lack of empathy, Empathy. So that to me is where a lot of us were kind of seeing this other side of him where it's like, mm, something about this just doesn't fit right. All of that being said, the prosecution asked that the court follow sentencing within the guidelines. They really just kind of left it in the hands of the court. He was like, look, if you think you need to do it higher, go for it. If you think you need to go below what's recommended, go for it. But they did ask for one thing, and that was that the court to impose a maximum sentence that would match Paul's life experience expectancy, specifically because there was no formal diagnosis yet, but there was this huge possibility there that he has a personality disorder 
and therefore could pose a huge threat to society if he does not receive treatment, which I personally think is a pretty fair ask there. But the defense, however, argued against all of this and really seemed to want to remind everyone that they believed Paul was a victim as well. They argued against the fact that he had been described as an enforcer, which is something that he had been labeled as this entire time. And his attorney tried to say that he just didn't have the mental capacity to understand that what he was doing was wrong. And I will state that during all of his evaluations, there was no like cognitive issues and this potential antisocial personality disorder. There was no other diagnoses there that proved that he didn't know or understand what he was doing when he was doing it. But they still really pushed this idea saying that, you know, he's just young, he's following his mom's instructions, she's older, she should have been wiser. And then one thing that really got to me is that his attorney stated that their difference in relationship to Timothy should be considered as well, as in like, Shonda abusing her son and Paul abusing his brother. This man legitimately said that rivalry is expected between siblings. And I about choked because I have a lot of siblings, okay? I've got five of them. And rivalry is a thing. And in none of that rivalry is it expected and normal to abuse that sibling at all. I don't know why he thought that was a good thing to say, but it was just not it. And to support the idea that Paul was simply following directions, the attorney also argued that there were no texts at all where Paul himself gave Shonda instructions to abuse Timothy. And I will say that I didn't see anything like that in any of the text messages that I heard being read out, but they were still both very actively participating. And considering the fact that they both lived in the same house together, they spoke over cameras as well, which is not something that's recorded and the fact that Timothy himself had to use his own hands and his own brain to act out these things, I just don't see how that's a really good valid argument. And he finished it off by saying that Paul showed remorse, he cooperated fully, and he had shown that he was genuinely confused about how any of this happened. And then Paul was given the opportunity to speak. And I am going to play this for you, but I will preface it by saying, I really don't have much to say about what Paul said. It's exactly what I expected him to say. I don't think there's any anything at all profound about it. And I feel like all he has done majority of the time when he has spoken, other than just give out facts on the case, is he's tried everything he can to ask for people to be lenient with him. And I just don't like it. There's just not this apology there that you would expect. I'm not getting remorse. I'm getting, I'm trying to save my ass. What reasons could justify my actions? I could make up a thousand and never believe one. What words could voice my regrets? I can think of millions, yet never feel it's enough. If I could do it all again and do it right, I would. I feel I will pay for my choices and yet never feel better because he's still gone. I have had time to think during my time in Muskegon County Jail, and I've realized many things about myself that I might never have, other, have considered otherwise. My problems and flaws, to put it simply, are the place to begin correction of self. I asked the judge for nothing more than mercy and fairness, to offer me compassion so I might learn from him. I only hope to better myself in the coming days and serve my time with what little honor I have left, and to make right my faults in search of a better tomorrow. And then finally, the moment that I know we have all been waiting for because you guys made it very evident in my last video that we all have the same appreciation for Judge Castle and his eloquent words and the way that he says things as they are. Um, and he misses nothing. You can tell that he genuinely loves his job and wants to do the right thing and wants to protect the people and wants to do things fair. And so this is what Judge Castle had to say before handing down the sentence. Now, I did not include the entirety of what he had to say like I did last time because it was like 30 minutes long with Paul. I just took out a bunch of key moments that I believe that everyone needs to hear. And as per usual, this man is so well spoken and fair and honest and I really appreciate him more than words can even express. I find that to be quite persuasive in terms of whether or not Mr. Ferguson is suffering from any intellectual disability and the court can concludes based on, on this report 
uh, well-written report, well-grounded in, in uh, fact and history of the defendant, that he was not suffering from an intellectual disability currently or at the time of this offense. Uh, the second thing is whether or not Mr. Ferguson was somehow manipulated or coerced by his mother. Uh, I think all of us would like to believe that this is a product of manipulation, that this is simply somebody doing something that they were told to do, that they were afraid. Uh, Mr. Alden Brady mentioned it in his allocution regarding the specific text messages. Well, those specific text messages I heard as well at the trial. Uh, shortly after the trial concluded, I had asked the prosecutor's office for a complete copy of every single text message that would occur between Ms. Vander Ark and Mr. Ferguson because I didn't want just the snippets, the kind of highlights or the, you know, the, the real you know, juicy stuff, for lack of a better term. I wanted to understand completely what the conversation was between these individuals. I read every single text message, every one of them. I, I think there's thousands in there, and I've read it three times now. Three times in total, I read it you know, two months ago, I read it a month ago, and I read it last week, Friday. The entire afternoon was spent reading through these things. And I think it's clear to me that Mr. Ferguson, although he says that he was scared of his mother or there's an allegation at that standpoint, I find that just the opposite to be true based on those text messages. Uh, there is some mention about punishment, but I think Mr. Ferguson, um, in my opinion, t uh, being submissive, for lack of a better term, to his mother was a result that he really had nowhere else to go. Uh, he had been kicked out from his father's house for, for failing to obey his father's rules and for other things. And he went to his mother's house, and I don't think Mr. Ferguson really had anywhere else to go. I think he was sort of uh, beholden to his mother uh, in terms of, well, there's gonna be consequences Although there are some text messages, one or two of those that bear that out, uh, this strikes me in the text messages as more of a collaborative effort. In fact, there's some text messages where Ms. Van der Ark actually tells Mr. Ferguson uh, that if Ms. Timothy does not behave, essentially, I'm going to leave him to you, as in that he's going to let the dog out and just log off the chain. And uh, Mr. Ferguson also several times um, essentially tells his mother things that are going on that are bad. Uh, and I think it's because he wants his mother to give him the permission to go ahead and engage in punishment. So in terms of, of whether or not his mother, he was somehow afraid of his mother, uh, I don't think that to be the case. Now, that was my initial feeling about it and my and what, I, what I took it as, and that's why I wanted the uh, assessment regarding whether or not he was being manipulated and luckily we uh, we did get one from uh, uh, the second one I referenced was from Dr. Farhad regarding his uh, intellectual uh, abilities he says from a diagnostic standpoint I did not find sufficient evidence to support Mr. Ferguson meeting criteria for any specific mental disorder while one may consider whether his presentation suggested a neurodevelopmental condition, for e.g. autism spectrum disorder, I did not find this to be an appropriate label. Instead, I attributed his overall demeanor and presentation to factors such as a lack of socialization, normalization of abnormal dynamics and experiences, poor interpersonal skills and emotional dysregulation. He also indicated later on on that page that I was initially asked to evaluate whether Mr. Ferguson had a mental condition or traits that would have rendered him susceptible to coercion, manipulation, or suggestibility at the time of the offense. Ultimately, I could not arrive at this conclusion based on the totality of the available information. Available evidence noticed, noted that he was capable of appreciating the abuse towards his brother, that he was capable of recognizing the detrimental impact it had, and that he at times disobeyed Ms. Van der Ark and tried to provide his brother with aid and support. Furthermore, despite reporting that he was under Ms. Van der Ark's, quote, psychological hold, he adamantly denied that he was coerced or manipulated into enforcing the abuse. Additionally, he recognized to some degree pleasure in having power and control over his younger brother. 
In this sense, while I acknowledge that he reported experiencing fear and concerns of disobeying Ms. Vander Ark, I could not reliably substantiate his involvement as being a byproduct of suggestibility, uh, suggestibility or uh, coercion. So what this court is left to conclude is that Mr. Ferguson, the way I look at this is that Mr. Ferguson and these reports, and, and a lot of these, there's, throughout the report, there's, there's talk about how Mr. Ferguson bullied his brother uh, when he was younger. Uh, that uh, there's a mention, his, his stepsister, who I think was uh, allocated on behalf of his mother, uh, or, or, or on behalf of Paul, uh, or excuse me, Timothy, at his, uh, at Miss Vanderark's sentencing. This is, this is the stepsister, and this is before the police even really gave, told her about exactly what had happened in here. It says the stepsister reportedly told the police that, quote, she doesn't know how involved Paul was in this situation, but he is the biggest bully she has ever met in her life, and he found genuine joy in tormenting Timothy whenever possible. It was someone who, without even knowing the full details, uh, reported that. In one of the interviews, uh, Mr. Ferguson indicated that he liked getting praised by Shonda and admitted he liked having control over Timothy. He reportedly admitted having power over somebody feels good. Later in the, in the interview, I asked him whether he had felt ashamed at the time when he was abusing his brother, and he said, quote, no, he had not. I asked whether he had recognized his action as morally wrong at the time, and he again said, quote, no, he had not. He then volunteered that on one occasion, quote, I sent her a photo of how thin he was, and, and, why, and when I asked why he did this, he explained that I was worried. When asked when he was worried about Mr. Ferguson, repl uh, Ferguson replied that he had been concerned for his health, observing that he was nothing but bones. I asked him whether he had, at the moment, thought that this abusive behavior was wrong, and he replied that, quote, that thought never even crossed my mind. The, the court read this and certainly looks at this as someone who is predisposed, I think was the ultimate conclusion, predisposed to abuse his brother, specifically the victim in this case. He had a history of doing that. Now, I have no doubt in my mind that Mr. Ferguson is a result of years and years and years of physical neglect and abuse on behalf of his mother. No doubt in my mind that's borne out in this report. But the court is asked to essentially ignore the decisions or his behavior because of that and to somehow say that we're going to minimize the damage and what he did in this case because of that. If the court started imposing that standard, I think we it would be in, in, a, in a real trouble because every defendant that comes before this court has a horrible history, I would say. That's the reason they're here. People that have supportive parents and, and things go good for them typically don't come here. Now, that's not always the case. Believe me, there's a lot of interventions, but everybody has a history. And what I was looking at is whether or not this is a product of his mother or his situation, and what I can conclude is that this is not. Mr. Ferguson is trying to shift blame from his mother, from him to his mother, to say that somehow, well, if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have done this, or she's the one that did this. At the trial, well, at her at her order, at her order, at her order, he kept saying it over and over and over again as it just keep underscoring the point. And if that had been an isolated incident, if that had been one or two of these things, if that had been a punishment that he administered, maybe the court could accept that. But we have an individual who was in a household for six months intentionally himself engaging in torture of another person. And he doesn't, is well, I'm worried about what my, my mom's going to say. Clearly, that doesn't, it's not borne out in these reports. He had the ability to disobey his mom. In fact, he was on the stand and almost boasted that, well, I gave him extra food. Well, weren't you worried about how your mom was going to be upset? I still gave him extra food. So what that tells me is that this has been a 
careful, manipulated, manipulated story by Mr. Ferguson from the very beginning of this thing that he's going to put the blame on his mom. I'm going to be manipulated. I have Asperger's syndrome. I have autism. I have Stockholm syndrome. There's mention of him saying, well, maybe I have Stockholm syndrome in here. No, this is an individual. What the truth of this is, the truth of this is, is that we have two individuals, two individuals that lack empathy, who lack emotion, and both of them, the triggering factor in this report, the triggering factor that caused this abuse was the removal of the husband, of stepdad. Once he was gone, these two individuals were free to torture somebody, and they did it. That's what they did. And I think Ms. Van Der Ark did use Mr. Ferguson. I think that she knew from his history that he was predisposed to torment Timothy. I think that she knew that he would have no problem doing that. And Mr. Ferguson walked through that door and was happy to be the enforcer, was happy to do it, and continued to torture his brother over and over and over and over until he was a shell of a person, until he was dead, died from starvation, died from hypothermia. He had no, no fat on him, barely any muscle on him. And the whole time, just letting it happen. The report says it appears that the stepfather's presence in the home had prevented Paul and his mother from abusing the victim. Again, it wasn't anything to do. He, he, they were just holding him back, essentially. The overall opinion, which I think is important, says, in my opinion, although the defendant's participation in the abuse was a, in was in a part a function of his social milieu and living situation. These contextual factors were not a necessary condition for his participation. In my opinion, Mr. Ferguson's involvement in repeated acts of abuse that amounted to physical and psychological torture over a period of months reflects a general lack of empathy for his brother and a lack of remorse for his actions. It concludes that, in my opinion, there is no reason to believe that Mr. Ferguson's conduct disorder has remitted or that his participation in the abuse of his brother was not an expression of a persistent pattern of antisocial conduct. The court is concerned uh, that Mr. Ferguson will not get the help he needs in prison. Uh, I think he's one step away from becoming a psychopath like his mother. And uh, the court is concerned that he represents a danger to the public. Uh, that if released, he, he would represent a significant danger to the public. The, 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 the charge here is child abuse. And um, I don't think this charge or the sentencing guidelines take into adequate consideration of the long sustained torture in this case. And I don't think the guidelines, quite frankly, can even, these guidelines don't justify Mr. Ferguson's actions. Mr. Ferguson, I, I think you are a product of your environment, but I don't believe you that you're sorry. I don't. I don't think you have empathy. I don't think you have any emotion whatsoever. And that's what scares the court. It really scares me. Uh, I think you're sorry that you're here. I think you're sorry you got caught. I don't think you wanted Tim to die either, like your mother, because you would get caught and you wouldn't torture him anymore. And um, believe me, I, I have tried to sit here and try to think, well, maybe Mr. Ferguson's not as bad as mom. I think you're just as bad, if not worse. If not worse. Because you, you had a job. You, you could have, Mr. F Johnson actually asked you, couldn't you have brought home a, 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 a thing of food for him? You could have gone to a neighbor and said, hey, my mom's abusing him. You could, have, you could have grabbed him and got him out of there. You could have done any number of things to stop this, and you chose not to. Your own brother. And uh, this is where we're at. So based on all that, 
the sentence of the court. You served 30 years to 100 years, Michigan Department of Corrections. Credit for 592 days you've already served. All right, so as you can see, the judge took a lot of time to really think things through, to go through every bit of information. I was so excited to hear him say that he wanted to see every single text and not just ones that have been cherry picked out because it's so easy to form an opinion and get a very specific idea of something when you don't have everything. I have learned this the hard way so many times on this channel. There were so many people that did genuinely express that they felt that Paul felt threatened, that he feared his mom, all of these different things. And it's just, it really doesn't seem like the case. It just seems like he took advantage of so many different opportunities. And just like I said in my first video, you know, when it came to what his stepsister had to say about him and that she didn't know the extent that he was involved in whatever happened, but he definitely did it of his own free will. And that essentially he moved in with his mom because he wanted to be taken care of. And I feel like it's just the same theme with him over and over again, where he genuinely just cares about himself. Um, you know, as long as he's getting what he needs, as long as he's getting what he wants, he'll do what his mom says because that keeps him a spot in that house, which is where he wants to be because no one else wants him to be there because of the way he treats people. They're like two peas in a freaking pod here. When you really start paying attention to all the things people have said about Paul, all of the things that he has said about himself and all the dynamics really start to get a little more of a clear picture. I'm honestly so thankful that the judge called it out and said, you know what, you're like, a step away from becoming a psychopath, just like your mom. And he literally said, and you may even be worse than your mom. And I honestly could not agree more. That's been one thing that's been just eating me alive looking into this entire case and reading all the comments and listening to all the interviews and looking through all the police files is obviously Shonda is a terrible person, but so much of this abuse was at Paul's hands. It was also very interesting to watch Paul respond to things throughout his mother's trial and to what Judge Castle had to say. You can very clearly see when he gets angry or irritated. And it's interesting to see what he seems to react to the most. And if you're, again, someone that's very into reading body language, I feel like it tells you a whole lot. Um, and it was very interesting to see that when he was sentenced, he really did seem shocked. I think that he truly believed that he could act like a victim and get away with what he did. Now, just like I said about Shonda, I am sure that he is absolutely going to appeal, but I do not believe that it will be successful for either of them. But I honestly don't think that a court at any level will want to have to hear this out again with all of the evidence and information that they had. And not only because of the horrific nature of that evidence, but also just the sheer amount of it. This is not one of those cases where there's like this questionable air to it at all. Um, it is pretty cut and dry, clear exactly what was going on here. At the end of the day, Timothy got justice. He isn't here anymore. And he deserved so, so much more throughout his entire life. But at the very least, those that are responsible are locked up. And so many times I feel like we witness the justice system fail and seeing it pull through is incredible. Even though he had been failed so many times before, at least one time it feels like something, they got something right here. I don't think that there could have been a better judge put on this case. I don't think that there could have been a better prosecutor put on this case. And I don't think a better police department could have investigated this case. So many people, very obviously cared about Timothy without even knowing him. And it truly made all of the difference. Obviously, if there are appeals or anything more happens after this, I will let you guys know, but I don't think I've been more excited to be done with a case and ever pretty much. And it's not that I don't want to remember Timothy and keep his name out there, but this has been horrific to look into, horrific to speak about. Having to even just re-listen to everything editing my video has probably been one of the hardest things that I've ever had to do as a mom. That will never trump the importance of getting this out there and just reminding people that there needs to be an overhaul of the system. We need to start caring more about each other. If we see something, say something. There were so many times that there were teachers and people that attempted to help Timothy and it just didn't happen for some reason. And I just feel like it is such a broken system. There's no telling, honestly, how many more kids are out there in this exact same position and no one knows about it. Before I even sat down to film this, I actually saw a comment on my last video of someone saying, why would you even cover this? Like this is, you shouldn't even talk about this. And that is 
in my opinion, the exact opposite of what needs to happen. Of course, it's a lot easier to not hear these details. Ignorance absolutely is bliss, but the reality of it is things like this affect all of us. Crimes like this go on to change our laws. Crimes like this go on to change people's lives. Unfortunately, this is a very scary, harsh reality of our world and it could happen to legitimately anyone. This could be your cousin, this could be your nephew. And there are so many parts at play here. There's no telling how many people may have heard about Timothy's story and are like, wait a minute, this reminds me of someone that I know. There's just so much that can be taken from it. On that note, I'm gonna go ahead and go, you guys. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to all of this and hear the update. I honestly hope we never have to utter Shonda's or Paul's name ever again. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit the subscribe button down below so you can become a part of the Hallen fam so that we can bring them home together or bring them justice together. And I will see you guys in my next video.